Hey, good weekend to you. Welcome to Leading Edge. I'm Jerry Anderson. Good to see you folks. Closing in on the May 3rd primary election now. We have updates on a couple of fronts, one Republican, one Democratic. I had, you know, in the campaign, we expect to hear from candidates what they have done, what they plan to do. But what if right in the middle of a campaign, you trotted out a policy proposal that you think could and should be enacted and happening right now? It happened on the gubernatorial campaign trail this week. We're going to have that for you. But first, Toledo, front and center. Well, okay, kind of in the background, but still very visually prominent in what is becoming a higher and higher profile campaign in the race for Ohio's U.S. Senate seat being vacated by Senator Rob Portman. You've seen the spot with a local refinery in the background and my first guest in the foreground, State Senator Matt Dolan, Republican, wants to be U.S. Senator Matt Dolan. His is a GOP campaign that seems to differ from the others in so much that he's not out there groveling for a Trump endorsement, isn't proclaiming a love affair with guns, uh, isn't denying the truth about an election that his side lost, but is writing some real issues that if the rest of the field splits the pro-Trumpian base, could see Matt Dolan ride to the GOP nomination. Okay, folks, that's just my take. How'd I do, man? <laughs> Sounds like a winning strategy. Is that yours? Well, it is certainly part of the strategy, but I also think that I'm the only one that's focused on Ohio. And I think even Trump supporters are going to look to me and say, boy, he, he enacted Trump policies. He agrees with Trump's policies. But we need to look forward now. We have to stop the Biden administration we need to set a positive agenda for 2024. Let's do, I think that's the winning message. Let's get some positive agenda going then, again, from a Matt Dolan point of view. I'm going to stay with the campaign ad. Energy policy is a campaign issue. Well, folks, at four buck a gallon gasoline, you bet it's fair game. It would seem, Senator Dolan, though, that you have a bigger beef with Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who does actually want to shut down the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline President Biden, however, has differed with the governor, has said we're not going to close energy pipeline number five or Enbridge pipeline number five. So how do you put that at his feet and expect it to stick? Well, you put it at the feet of the Democratic administration, of which he is the, the head. And it, it started with his uh, decision to say American workers, Ohio workers, we're not going to create our own energy in the United States anymore. We're going to go rely on Iran, Venezuela, OPEC, and even Russia. So that began the assault on uh, energy creation in America. I am for all the above energy. And if you are going to have an administration that's going to say, let's shut down the Keystone Pipeline, let's shut down Line 5, what incentive do, does anyone have to invest in energy creation in uh, America? These pipelines are essential for distribution to get the gas and oil to the refineries. If you don't have those, where are you going to distribute your gas and oil? So the, the, this is the epitome of hurting American workers, hurting American energy, gener energy generation. Matt Dolan is my guest state senator. I think it's Senate District 24. Do I have that right, sir? That's correct. The Ohio yeah. Senate. All right. Uh, and while we're here, though, again, the president has has said he doesn't want to close pipeline number five. But Senator Dolan, you're right. I think it was day one of his administration. It was boom, X, the Keystone XL pipeline. By the same token, production of American crude in 2021 this past year was right on par. Eleven point two eight three million barrels under it was right on par with the trump administration biden has surpassed former president trump in issuing drilling permits on public lands the u.s information administration says crude production will climb to 12 million then record a record next year and and so i'm trying to make that fit yeah this, it, help me that's fair that's fair but there, there, you, you, there's a lot in there first of yeah. all it, drilling permits only are effective if the permit is granted in an area where it's likely we're going to have gas and oil. True. So you can't just go by the number of permits. There are barren wells out there that, that can't produce. Second is, you know, because of what we've been accomplishing in America over the last several years, 
we do have the abundance of, of creation, but it's going to recede. And that's what's beginning to happen. The demand has not gone away. The American made supply has. And so you're seeing two things. You're seeing them go to our enemies, as I said before, which is very, very disturbing to me that we're reliant on anyone for our energy. And two, he's, he's tapping into our emergency strategic uh, reserve, right. which was not designed to reflect policy decisions. It was designed for emergency crises throughout the world. Think, think of uh, the oil embargo in the 70s. I mean, that's what that was designed for. So you can give me statistics, but the reality of the actions suggest we are not creating in inside America what we should to meet the demand. Uh, you, you're going to suggest we don't have a global crisis? Thank Ukraine for just a moment in, in Russia. So, no, we, we, we have a global crisis, but because we are now relying on Russia, OPEC, and Venezuela, that global crisis has also morphed into furthering the energy crisis that did get started by the Biden administration. So I am not suggesting that, that you know, we don't have a crisis out here. But there are, ju just like why we have Intel coming into Ohio, mm -hmm. is because we want to start making microchips in America so we're not reliant on China. Yep. Why isn't it any different with energy? Why in the world would we want to rely on Iran, Venezuela, and OPEC for our energy when we have the capabilities to do it in our own country? But when you shut down pipelines, when you aren't stopping governors who want to shut down pipelines, Again, that's distribution. Gotcha. You make a product and you have nowhere to give, give it up. Send you it. hit another. This is Matt Dolan uh, running for the U.S. Senate, the seat being vacated by Ron Portman. You hit on another, I think, Biden vulnerability, the southern border. I think a lot of folks have concern there. And I read just this week, Matt Dolan, about split. You, pro you probably know this about splits. I mean, at the high level within the White House, splits within the administration over what course to take. So just that I'm clear, you would finish building the wall, right? That's a yes. That is a yes. Okay. You, you, on that for Go ahead. You, would you take kids away from their parents like the last administration did? So um, if, if we have a system in place that we had before where we were determining if they are truly seeking asylum right. or not, and if they're not seeking asylum, if they're illegal immigrants coming across, and if the, there is no we've had no vetting, then yeah, we're gonna have to create a system upon which we, we know who's coming in. And there's gonna be some very difficult decisions that need to be made. Uh -huh. However, you can do it more efficiently and effectively so that you keep track of where the children are, where the parents are, and, and you, you re reunite them quickly. Uh -huh. But that is part of the vetting process. The wall is three-tiered in my mind. It's a physical barrier that does work. It's a technological barrier and it's border patrol with the authority to act. Couple that with the stay in Mexico policy. Then you begin to avoid separating families because you've made determinations before they've crossed the border. The stay in Mexico policy, by the way, initiated by President Trump and may we say President Biden has continued the stay in Mexico He's policy. He's continued in name only. Okay. He, not, he has not provided the same authority. He's Matt Dolan. Uh, I wanted you guys to get to know him. You're seeing him all the time in ads. I wanted to have a conversation. We need to take a break, Senator. Can we do that? Sure. Uh, this is Leading Edge. I'll be right back with more right after this. But back on Leading Edge, he is State Senator Matt Dolan. Republican wants to be U.S. Senator. You see his ads on the year we were talking about the southern border. Let me wrap it up with this. Do you, Senator, favor a path to citizenship for immigrants already here, including the kids who were brought here not of their own doing by their parents years ago? Fair question. I, I am going to stay laser focused on securing the border. Those are questions that we need to answer. But when we try to do everything at once, we get nothing. And that's why we have the problem. So we have got to create a bipartisan effort to secure the border, stop the flow. Okay. Then we can have a meaningful discussion about what we do with those who are here. But until we secure the border, we can't have any other discussions. 
The man you want to replace, Rob Portman, was a central negotiator, as you well know, Senator, in the federal infrastructure bill that passed the U.S. Congress on a bipartisan uh, fashion, which will bring millions, or is it billions, to Ohio. Republicans were urged to vote against it. Many did. To give Biden no victory, you supported that bill, didn't you? I did, for, for lots of reasons. First of all, you don't make politics at the expense of the Ohio worker, the Thank Ohio you. economy. And that's what my opponents are doing. They're playing politics at the expense of workers and, and energy or uh, economics. Mm. Look, one of the reasons I'm the best candidate in this race is because I have experience, which means I know the difference between a good bill and a bad bill. The infrastructure bill negotiated by Portman allows for an influx of money for short-term jobs, short-term meaning three to five years, and long-term economic development, including in the Toledo area, your ports. Yeah. Build Back Better is a bad bill because it expands the role of government. It increases the role of spending. It makes people more dependent on government. So knowing the difference is, is important. Then when you have the pres former president of the United States telling candidates don't support this bill because it gives them a win and they and they listen to him and not Ohio, uh, to me, that's disqualifying. How are you going to go to Washington and say you're fighting for Ohio when the first chance you had a chance to do it, you didn't you didn't step up? That's why I wanted this guy on my show. Also, Mike Gibbons. And it, I'm, I'm looking at this stuff between Mandel and Gibbons throwing stuff back and forth. It would appear that they think each other is, is the person to beat. Mike Gibbons says the middle class doesn't pay its fair share in taxes. You're not exactly middle class, to be fair, Matt Dolan, but you exploded on that one. Why? I mean, on a percentage basis, I guess you could make his case. Your thoughts? Well, uh, no one should be paying more income tax. And to me, that just kind of shows a couple of things. It shows that Mike, again, is not running a campaign that reflects what Ohioans are talking about and need. The, uh, Ohioans don't need to pay more income tax. Ohioans need to make sure that they have the money in their pocket to reinvest in their families, reinvest in their businesses. A and uh, th this idea that there's a fair share out there, no, there's an idea that government needs to be more efficient and effective so it is requiring less and less from its citizens, but providing more and more. And that's the, I, I've cut income taxes, I've cut manufacturing taxes, I've cut capital gains taxes. We need to cut the corporate, federal corporate tax rate in, in America so that we make good jobs want to come back to Ohio and America. So, you know, look, Mike, uh, he's inconsistent. He says one thing and then he blames the press or he says he's taken out of context. These are important jobs. You know, public servants, you need to be transparent and honest with your constituents. That's going to do it for time. Man, I wish I had more. I'll tell you what, you get it done in, in May 3rd, and then we'll we'll talk a lot more. <laughs> I look forward to it. Very, I, I love the interchange. Thank you very much. Hey, State Senator Matt Dolan wants to be U.S. Senator. Thanks for spending time with us, bringing us up to speed and keeping us on the leading edge, as we like to say here on Leading Edge, of his campaign. When I come back, we're going to jump over to the Democratic side of things and the gubernatorial race. This is Leading Edge. So what if you threw an election and instead of hot button posturing and mudslinging, oh, I don't know, Mandel and Gibbons coming to mind, you actually had some, in the heat of the battle, usable ideas come up. We're jumping now to the Democratic side of this primary, and we're jumping over to the governor's race. And so it was this week that the ticker of, ticket of former Cincinnati Mayor John Cranley and Toledo State Senator Teresa Fetter said, hello, we have billions of unused dollars over here. And over here, we have thousands and thousands of Ohio students who we know have fallen behind because of school experiences massively interrupted by the pandemic. How about we give them a chance to catch up. We'll pay for it. We can do it this summer. It'll be voluntary. All schools will be involved. And as John Cranley and Teresa Fetter join us, I'm wondering, that's why I wondered you guys on, did we just get a peek into the mind of how a Cranley Fetter governorship would work? I mean, now that it's out there, this thing it's just like, hey, this just makes sense. Uh, would, how would this work? Could a governor unilaterally do it? Would it take legislative approval? Mr. Mayor? Uh, no, the governor can do it and needs to show leadership because there's nothing more important than our children's education. 
There is a constitutional mandate in Ohio that the state, led by the chief executive officer, the governor, provide an equal and fair education. There is bipartisan agreement that children have suffered the biggest harm during COVID outside of loss of life in terms of emotional distress, loss of learning, et cetera. This is a moral crisis. We have to give remedial summer school options to families and students who want to catch up. And it has to be far more rigorous than what would be a normal summer, summer school offering. And <clears throat> right now you, you, you have these uh, uh, silly fights, uh, but the real issue is that kids need to catch up with what has been lost. Well, it's only in their interest. It's also good for the state of Ohio. Teresa Fetter, Senator, good to see you as always. You know, you spent time at the uh, at the front of the classroom. Good Lord, that's a, that's a saint who, who works up in front of a classroom, folks. Uh, governor's people are out there saying, okay, nothing new here. School districts already have the means they want if they want to implement a program like this. Your reaction, are they wrong? Well, it needs specific leadership and leadership that's drawing from all of the community community's resources. I think of retired engineers who would probably love to have a robotics club. Um, all of these good enrichment programs will help children feel more confident in their learning. It's not stressful with tests. It'll be something that the community can wrap their arms around and really provide that kind of encouragement for our students to feel more confident. I've talked to teachers throughout you know, this past year and they're talking to me about the mental health of students, mm. that they're breaking down by doing the tasks that they did before the pandemic that they were confident about now. But now there's so much pressure and they're, not, they're so unsure about their learning in this environment that they're living in, that they need that extra push. And the governor, providing that opportunity and bringing people together like a governor can and all around the communities in Ohio, it's going to advance that closing, advancing. You guys, that, are you both suggesting Mike DeWine could do this now and should do this now? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. And, it's, it's and if Mike, it works as it should work. It's look. Mike DeWine's fault that kids lost all this education. So it's no surprise that he's shrugging his shoulders like, oh, well, schools can do it if they want to do it. We have a constitutional obligation in Ohio for the state to provide K through 12 education. Well, that's according the Duralt, to the Ohio the Duralt, Constitution. Yeah, the Duralt decision is 25 years old. We've never had equal and fair uh, uh, education in this state. Mike DeWine's been in power the whole time. And so he is the problem. The right. solution is educating kids. Right. Um, you guys are in a primary fight. So I'm gonna, in fairness, gonna bring this up. Uh, former Dayton uh, governor, our mayor, this former uh, Dayton mayor, Nan Whaley, said, wait a minute, in, in, in Dayton here, we've got a pre-K program. I'm very, very much involved in, in education. So I want to know, uh, you were the mayor of Cincinnati. Does Cincinnati have a pre-K program? Yeah, I helped lead an effort to get two years of preschool uh, in 2016. Uh, actually, we were the first city in Ohio to get all three and four-year-olds into preschool education. And we were glad to see Dayton follow suit. Uh, and Toledo has its pilot program out there. We've got a couple hundred kids in it now. We know there are so many out there that still, it, it, we're growing it in Toledo. Uh, I brought up Nan Whaley. Her TV ads this week carried a ringing endorsement from Senator Sherrod Brown. You had to know that was coming because he's been pretty public about that early on. Uh, was the summer school announcement Senator uh, intended to blunt that in some way, in some way? And how do you react to what you're seeing on the airwaves? Well, what I'm saying is that we need leadership from the top, specific leadership that can draw groups and communities together and not just encourage them and suggest that they do, but bring forward the full capacity that you have as a governor to lead the way and bring entities outside of the school districts into the solution. And uh -huh. that's going to build community. Senator's not biting on my Sherrod Brown question. <laughs> well, oh, I, 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 want I you, absolutely I want you, will. Okay, now I, I want you guys to react. Let to me really take a, I can take a stab at that. Go, John. Um, Sherry Brown is not on the ballot in November. And so Nan Whaley can't hide behind Sherry Brown in November. It can help her in the primary for sure. Yeah. But the question is, who can win in November? And, and here are the facts. Cincinnati's economic growth has outperformed Mike DeWine's Ohio. Dayton has underperformed Ohio. Dayton lost population in the last 10 years. Cincinnati grew twice as fast 
as the state of Ohio? How are we going to fire a Republican in Ohio if the alternative is worse than the status quo? What I'm offering is better than the status quo, and Democrats need to win. We're all going to unite uh, around the nominee, whoever it is. Yeah. But the bottom line is, how do we best beat Mike DeWine? And Sherrod yeah. Brown's not going to be on the ballot in November. But one of us is going to be. And I believe uh, that Teresa and I are the best chance for Democrats. And from a partisan point of view, folks, this is how you handicap November. You do it on, on May 3rd. Um, I, I'm a little troubled uh, in either way you want to handle this. I've only got about a minute or so. I, I, you got to be troubled, too, because uh, I love participation in voting. And I'm hearing that 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 turnout in the early is is really down. Well, I want to blame the leaders at the state house. You know, Senator Matt. I'm Hoffman. sorry, Huffman. Yep. And Representative, who's now Speaker Cup, and the commission, which had Dewine and the other state leader, Secretary of State, and the Auditor Faber, they failed to apply the law, the Constitution, and putting fair maps together. They caused this chaos and confusion. It falls at their feet. And now we have to pay $25 million to do a second one. Yeah. So right uh, with, there, that should with, tell the voters, we need to vote them out. With, with districts that we still don't know. It, oh, don't get me started, because this is a side that says, well, let's impeach the, the uh, Chief Justice, who is just trying to enforce the Ohio Constitution and an amendment that we all voted on by seven Twice. Years. All right, Twice. kids, that's it. That's it for time. Interesting proposal this week. I'll be back on Leading Edge. Have a great Easter weekend, everybody. See you next week on Leading Edge.